Hello, everyone. Um, this is the Metatopia Online panel for lowering the barrier to entry for new gamers in traditional RPGs. Um, I'm Beth Rimmels, and I'm Will Sobel. Um, so, the one of the reasons why I was interested in doing this panel is because I am currently designing a game, Awesome Eights, to tackle this exact uh, this exact topic. And also, to in addition to doing game design, I've been a um, envoy herald, so teaching games to people, and I've been a store coordinator for various organized play um, programs. So teaching people how to play new games, and especially people who are absolute newcomers, is something I have a lot of experience with, and it's a passion of mine. <laughs> Will, why are you here? <laughs> so, <that's> <laughs> So I am a designer as well. Um, I also uh, work f uh, full time for Green Ronin, and I run demos and stuff like that uh, for various Green Ronin games uh, at conventions. Um, but the the one that got me kind of uh, interested in this particular topic was that I run demos for Green Ronin games uh, at trade shows. So for like retail partners and other uh, game publishers and designers and stuff like that. Um, and there's a lot of conversation about uh, new entry uh, into the market for new RPG players uh, in general, right? Um, and I think that there's a lot of reasons for that. And I think that there are a lot of games who like, they're so close right, to getting, like, these really cool mechanics that are uh, new player friendly, um, and uh, they don't see, they don't see that, and that, because it is, it's a skill, right, it's a, identifying those mechanics and identifying that play pattern uh, in particular is, is important. Yeah. Uh, so, when we were talking earlier, you said you had three bullet points that you had jotted down. Do you want to start yes. with those, or? yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, the first, um, and I think the one that people don't want to, like, they, some people know, but they don't, like, they don't want to look it in the face, is that um, uh, it's, it's good math, right? Uh, mm -hmm. good, good game design that helps new players is good math, and it's good math because we all know good math, right? Mm -hmm. And what I mean by good math is um, finding... Uh, crunch that's familiar and that's uh, that's a level of accessibility. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think the the thing that I want to talk about with good math is kind of where does this uh, where does game design math come from? And in traditional role playing, uh, the answer is Dungeons and Dragons, right? Like uh, a significant portion of new players are coming from Dungeons and Dragons, and I think they probably always have, and they. Mm -hmm probably will for the foreseeable future um, and in large part that's because of things like 5th edition being more accessible than 4th edition and 3.5 um, and also um, things like critical role right like the string uh, the, the amount of players who are coming in through things like watching actual plays is enormous yes. um, and so good math there comes from saying okay well um what is the math behind Dungeons and Dragons? Mm -hmm. um, and what can I, like, I, I always want accessible mechanics to come from somewhere, right? And they come from things that we're familiar with. Um, mm -hmm. And so as a game designer, you ask yourself, okay, here is this mechanic from Dungeons and Dragons. What can I do differently? And why am I doing it differently? And how does that impact the learning um, so going back to math is I roll 20, I have a certain number of modifiers, et cetera, et cetera. That's all straightforward. Everybody knows that. Um, and so finding your, finding an accessible mechanic that's similar, but different enough, mm -hmm. um, is kind of what I'm talking about here. Um, something that people can, uh, look at and do, uh, that makes them feel familiar to that, but also like, oh, that's interesting. Right. 
Um, you touched on two points that I want to elaborate on. One okay. of which is a uh, critical role. Because, um, as I said, I was a store organizer for organized play for my local game store for a number of years. Um, primarily, but not exclusive, but not only, um, D&D Adventures League. Yeah. And so, um, and at the height of it, the store, I was overseeing five GMs, so five tables mm -hmm. of D&D &D once a week. Um, and Critical Role brought in a lot of people into the store. Now, they didn't always stay because sometimes, you know, they just couldn't make, this was the only time they could make that schedule or something. Um, but Critical Role definitely drives a lot of new people into the hobby. And I think what's important about that is separate from, you know, math or rules or whatever, Critical Role illustrates the key point of RPGs, which is the role-playing part. Correct. Because prior to actual plays, and Critical Role is obviously the most successful of them, um, trying to sometimes explain to people what role-playing was, mm -hmm. was a real challenge. And mm -hmm. I did that many times, but some people got it, some people didn't always get it. Critical Role has been a huge help in lowering that barrier to entry, and like I said, not just them. There's also, you know, the, the sirens and all the other, you know, actual play that's out there. Yeah. Um, so if you're trying to, if you have a group of friends that you want to try to entice into RPGs and you're, ha you know, they're not quite sure and they're not quite getting it, sitting down with them to watch a little bit actual play can also really help. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I want to uh, expand on that a little bit because... Um, if the thing that you're going for in an actual play is the role playing, which I think it, it should be, um, and that's what you're looking for to like demonstrate to other people, um, you should check out the Adventure Zone, which is um, another actual play, um, and they on like I don't know that it's the the first several episodes they get rules just wrong they just flat out get rules wrong um and the important takeaway there is they just keep playing they just keep moving forward um and because the important thing to them and to all the their listeners is just hey we're telling a cool story mm -hmm. and that's again the next key piece which is if you're trying to learn or the barrier to entry to absolute beginners to RPGs, you got to emphasize the story. Yes. Because they will eventually learn the rules, but it's the, the being the story, being to play the hero and everything else. That's what draws people in. So mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're designing the game and your target audience, as mine is to a degree, um, is new players, you don't necessarily want to lead with your demo explanations with the mechanics. You want to lead with the setting and what makes things cool to entice people and then divvy out what they need to know to play. And so many people, because they're so excited about, I made this game and it's based on this cool mechanic, and they lose people. Right. Um, so that actually ties into one of my other bullet points, um, which is uh, the structure of your book uh, in the scope of accessibility mm -hmm. and so like a lot of people a lot of books now um are written with this weird structure of like not weird structure it's a very traditional structure but it makes it feel like you're reading like a textbook right like um it, you know the third page has like six tables um and uh you know there's all kinds of um math and choices and stuff like that and that's fine and that works um i think it does turn a lot of people off um mm -hmm. because they're there for the story so structuring your book the way that you present information um making it feel more like um you were saying where you're putting the story first and you're saying here's what role playing is um a lot of books now have this structure where it's um Here's, you know, half a page about what is role-playing. Um, and uh, it's a role-playing game where we talk about role-playing for, like, uh, 200 words in a 40,000-word book or something like that, um, you know, is maybe a little disingenuous to new players who open up the book. That, and I think to circle back to actual plays, 
people are learning how to play through watching things like that more than they are using the manual to teach them how to play. And they're using manuals and handbooks or whatever as reference material instead of as um, teaching them how to play because it's not immersive and it's kind of grueling and, uh, you know, it gets the information across, but at what cost? Yes. And that actually leads to my key point whenever I'm talking to people about lowering the barrier to entry for new players, which is there is a big difference in game design or games just in general for what is easy to play for someone who has played a role-playing game before versus what is easy to play for someone who has never touched a set of dice or a game or sat down at a table to play a mm -hmm. game before. Yeah. And unfortunately... I find a lot of game designers are designing the first, which is great. I mean, we need those too, mm -hmm. but they think those are designed for the second. Yes. Yeah. So um, knowing what your product is and where mm -hmm. it falls in the scope of um, teaching new players um, is important. Um, I think that it's also important that no matter what scope your product is, mm -hmm. having a section that says, here is what what to expect so, mm -hmm. like I, I i like the using things like uh lines and veils and such like that yeah. not to just set the um expectation of what kind of content mm -hmm. um i'm looking for but if i'm playing anything other than D D, I use a similar proposal to say hey this is um this is what this game is mm -hmm. this is how to this is uh i like to lead with this is how you're successful in this game um, because that's what makes the players feel good, right? Like, is succeeding. Um, most people are playing um, RPGs where they're heroes or adventurers or good guys, right? And so they want the uh, they want the success because that's how their brain makes the feel-good juice. Right. Right. But, uh, like I said, Anyone watching this who is an aspiring game designer, I would really... And by the way, I should mention my day job is marketing. So I also think about games from the... How are you getting the word out about your game? You have the best game in the world. And if nobody knows about it... Yep. Um, but you really have to be clear and continually focus on who is it you want this game for. And look, mm -hmm. you can design a game as crunchy as you want. I sometimes like Crunch too. I grew up on Hero System. That was the second RPG I ever played. Okay. Um, so, so I I kind of like Crunch too. Um, but the thing is, though, and like I said, if you want to design a crunchy game, that's great. Um, but know that you're designing a crunchy game, and don't try to then tell people this is easy. Mm -hmm. And like I said, really focusing on the fact of that. What is easy for an experienced role player is not easy for an absolute newcomer. And you have to decide which of those two you're going for. Because, and if you go after the absolute newcomer, you're going to get experienced ones too. But if you're designing for the, oh, this is easy for an experienced role player, you may or may not get the first. Yeah. And, and it's all about design choices. Like I said, there's nothing wrong with targeting whatever audience you want. But it's a difference in how you describe your game, what the purpose of how you're making the game is going to be, what you're going to do to lower those barriers to entry, depending upon who you're targeting. I mean, if you're coming off of a hero system or GURPS or, you know, a Pathfinder, you know, 5th edition D&D is easy by comparison. Yeah. You know, but for an absolute beginner, I found that's not always the case. Yeah. The other, something that I'd like to expand on there is... Um, it, even if you're going for crunchy and you present it as crunchy, um, presenting the information in a way where um, your players naturally learn the crunch over a or so, uh, also super important. Um, that's like, that is not always necessarily up to the designer, it is up to the game master. Mm hmm but because it's up to the game master or the dungeon master or the narrator or um, whatever you use, that means that you need to provide them the tools and the guidance in order to do that. Because uh, the game master, like, I, I, I really detest the game master is not a player 
mm-hmm. uh, kind of logic. Um, Game Master is still engaging with design and the and the math that you created for them. Um, and so, uh, giving the, like they're obviously the ones who's who are crafting all of these, but they are crafting all of these things. The narrative and the encounters in the combat, or you know, the social encounters, or they're using all of that with tools that you're providing them. And that's right. one of the things that is really unique about RPGs is um, you can't account for everything. No. But what you can do is account for the human experience, which is the game master saying, that is cool and I want to use it. And in order for that to flow into um, lowering the barrier of entry for your new players means that you need to give the game master the tools in order to to craft that experience, right? And having uh, a game master's chapter is like uh, the basics that you can do of saying, hey, this is what you should expect. Um, but having a chapter where you say, hey, teaching people how to play a game is really hard, and here's here are here's this tool. Maybe like have a social encounter up front, have mm-hmm. a combat encounter later. You know, those kinds of like for some people who run demos very often, that kind of thing is obvious to us. But it might not be obvious to every single running your game. Right. And the nice thing about today's world, <coughs> excuse me, is that some, some, I've heard some people kind of argue against that about, well, how thick is my rule book going to be? You know, I'm just, you know, beginning game designer, you know, pages cost money, blah, blah, blah. Well, guess what? There's this lovely thing called the internet and you can design a website that has lots of supplemental material like that and mm-hmm. just have one line in the thing that, you know, for more information on or more tools or whatever and expand there, and then in the future edition, maybe that stuff gets into a supplementary book or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, And that may actually be handier for people, um, for for things, Um, because, you know, because then they can easily refer to it if they don't necessarily have the book with them and and things like that. So Um, something that Green Ronin does mm -hmm. is make GM's kits that Mm -hmm. usually come out alongside the core rule books, um, and that is just like a separate thing. Um, and we do print them. Um, they're usually very uh, accessibly priced. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, a lot of it is just organizing information that is already in the core rulebook or expanding on information that's in the core rulebook in a way that is easy for, like, game masters to, like, um, flick their eyes and see, oh, here is this chart, here is this table, or whatever, for easy reference. That is exactly that kind of thing. And that's a huge help. I mean, that's kind of switching over to a little bit more of uh, making things easier for the GM. But, oh my God, yes, as a GM, when I have to pause and, like, because something's in, in tiny type and I can't find it or mm-hmm. it's buried on page 214 or something, ugh, that makes things difficult. Um, I want to come back to slightly... Um, on well, one hand, I feel guilty for mentioning Dungeons and Dragons so much because there's so much more to the industry than that. Yes, uh, there there is. I'd like to I'd like to cap capture that for a second because there are so many more games out there than Dungeons and Dragons. So many more, thousands. Uh, if you go on Drive Through RPG, um, if you are a new player, please, 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 if you're looking to explore. Go to Drive Through RPG, and if you're a game designer and you're not familiar with Drive Through RPG, please go to Drive Through RPG. Oh God, yes. Look, look at what is best selling, and look at the preview pages. If nothing else, look at the like. A lot of the time, publishers will put the table of contents or preview pages into a free thing that you can just click on. The very least thing that you could do to familiarize yourself with the industry at large as a game designer is just look at the table of contents. So just and, and a lot of things on drive through also will have a quick start that's free or maybe like a pay what you want, you yeah, know, or, or something like that that you can just get like a sense of of what's going on even beyond the table of contents. Yes. So yes, the industry is so much more than Dungeons and Dragons. What you need to come to terms with as a game designer is 90% of the people who are going to play your game or look for your game 
uh, are from Dungeons and Dragons. And if they are new gamers and they are looking to branch out, mm -hmm. they are going to say, how easy is this compared to the edition? And um, that is a weird thing to design around. It, even if you make a mechanic that is like the exact opposite of everything 5th edition, which could, you know, it is a thing that people do, mm -hmm. you need to understand your mechanics relationship with D&D's mechanics so that you understand how to communicate to these people. You you can do things super differently. You can do things the, the but the farther away that you get from 5th edition, the more you need to understand how to communicate the differences yes. to new players. And yes. and game design boils down to two things. One is communicating the rules and two math. And I have a yeah. Sorry, can I bring in something from the chat? I'm your friendly yeah, disembodied voice, Sarah. Hi, uh, Sarah. So one person had said a bit ago, uh, exactly that, Beth, do not think you can judge easy when you've been playing RPGs your whole life. So I think uh, that's a comment, but I think it's an interesting question of what do you do, you know, how do you get around, how do you act like a naive reader or a naive player? Uh, and then another question that I'll throw out, or again, a, kind of a comment that I think is relevant, I'll actually, I've actually found a large party of players who find supplements not accessible, like I'm not going to read all that. Uh, so two things from the chat to keep in mind as your conversation's flowing. Yeah. And that's, I was going to say, actually, I'm, one of the things I'm designing with Awesome 8s is to make it, and don't get me wrong, I'm a huge reader and my day job is marketing copywriting, so I'm word girl. Um, but I'm trying to design it so that people have to read as little as possible to get into the game. Um, and I have proof of concept for that, but I don't want to just talk about, uh, about my game. Um, and I lost the thread of what I was going to say next. I'm sorry. You go, Will. <laughs> uh, so I'd like to, I, I have, um, a rebuttal to the first comment there mm -hmm. of, um, uh, to something to the atmosphere of, you can't say that it's easy to learn if you've been playing RPGs your whole life. And you know what? That is 100% true. Um, it's also why you shouldn't be the only person reading your game before you do anything with it. Like there's writing, editing, play testing, uh, beta readers, all that kind of stuff. And the the section beta readers here is you write the thing up and you do it um, so that you think that it's ex as accessible as possible. And surprise, it's not because right. as people we have bias right like that's just how that goes and so what you do is you get other people to read and you i always try to get as many people on as many different levels of familiarity as i can where sometimes i will give it to uh friends or family who are not gamers um and the other side to that is i will give it to uh, industry professionals that I know who have been playing RPGs for longer than I've been alive. Um, and usually what I do is the people on one end of the spectrum who have the experience are going to tell me, hey, you know, some so-and-so tried that 20 years ago and it didn't work. Um, and then the person who is not familiar with games at all is going to say, I don't understand what a D20 is. Um, and it's because in my bias, I neglected to explain what, you know, the, the very common one line of, hey, dice come in different sizes with different sides, and we commonly abbreviate that as D6 or D20. Um, and I use all of that information to just make a better product. Right. And that's where, when I say that, like, for the game I'm designing, I have proof of concept. I mean, on one hand, I have... Uh, professional play test where people like Kenneth Height are like, you have something here, this works. Mm -hmm. But then I also hunted out people who not only have never played a role playing game before, didn't even know where a role playing game was. But in one play test with absolute beginners, um, the scenario that I was taking them through was like a little espionage thing. Mm -hmm. And so I said, um, so it's like a spy story. And I said, um, so, you know, have you ever, you know, uh, played? Um, 
you know, like, are you familiar with, I think Leverage was on the air at the time, or whatever it was. I mentioned some TV show that was a spy TV show that was on the air at the time, and she was like, and they were like, nope, never heard of that. That's like Jason Bourne. Nope. I finally had to get down to James Bond before mm-hmm. they knew what I was talking about. That's how absolute beginner they were. Um, but then within 45 minutes of the game, they, they were actually role-playing, which is, yes, that's exactly what I'm going for. Um, going back to both the, the comment um, from the audience and then uh, to what, why I mentioned uh, Dungeons & Dragons again before, is when they were doing the play tests for creating 5th edition, they did their play test for that one massive. It's arguably, probably not arguably, the largest play test ever done in the industry for a role playing game. Yep. And they've never released all of the material that they learned from that play test, which I really wish they would. Um, but they've talked enough about it that there are things that you can glean from it as far as play testing material and newcomers to the game separate from whatever 5th edition became. And one of the key things that they found is if you, um, and it's why they have the starter kits and everything else, and why they also have certain things free online now, is uh, pre-gens. One of the biggest things that they found as a barrier to entry for people who were new to RPGs, or maybe they played one once ages ago and now they're trying to come back and try again, is that for live RPGs, the first thing they make you do is sit down and make a character. And that can take an hour, depending upon the game, or more. And that, you've lost people. They're sitting down, they don't even know what your game is, and you're asking them to pick who they are? That's, that's too daunting. So if you're designing a new game of any kind, whether it's a crunchy one or one you know, for easier people, have pre-gens for God's sake. Because mm-hmm. it's much easier to sit down with newcomers and say, okay, so this is an absent-minded sorcerer, and this is a hard-boiled detective, and this is a this. Which one do you want to do? And then you can guide them through what that means for the character sheet and everything else. Yeah. Um, and that's so, why now they have pre-gens in like, everything that they do. Making pre-gens also goes back to the way that you disseminate information. To, and even if you want to have a game, Showing them punch in sections as the session goes on is really easy to do with pre-gens. Um, I'd like to talk for a second about the second comment here, though, that uh, supplements are sometimes inaccessible and daunting. Um, yeah, yes, correct, 100%. Um, so the weird thing about supplements is um, and, and, and how they intersect, I think, specifically with this, um, with this topic is, and to, to kind of strain the topic, is lowering the barrier to entry for new players in traditional RPGs. Um, and the traditional there is kind of expecting that, I, th- I think the way that I usually interpret it is that you're going to go to print and that you're going to, like, this is you're making something fun and you're making something cool, but you're also, you need to recoup costs and stuff like that. Um, And so the traditional publishing part of this conversation is um, if you want to keep making games, you have to keep making money. Um, And supplements are uh, a a way to keep your fan base engaged, um, but also to get your uh, product in front of people's faces. Mm-hmm. Um, and yes, supplements are uh, daunting and sometimes inaccessible, and sometimes that creates um, a weird situation where you have a product on a shelf that there's no core rule book, but there is a supplement, and somebody wants to buy the supplement because they think that it looks interesting, but... Um, you know, there's no core rule book. Um, and that has more to do with the store's inventory levels or whatever. So the thing to, about supplements is that whenever I am talking about supplements, they're always a hundred percent optional. Um, and that's the only way I think to do that and still make them accessible. Um, but also 
to to create them in a way that is not completely cut off um, or secluded from things in the core rulebook. Right. Um, you want to provide information, but you don't want to like it's a weird sales tactic to say uh, in your implement. Uh, you know, this refers to the core rulebook. Uh, read those rules. Um, it's kind of unnecessary because I'm assuming that the players. Uh, customers in mm -hmm. conversation uh, eating a supplement they've already read the core rule book um, creating a page of references though so that you can go back and say hey this this supplemental rule affects this thing so that you can go easily in in a you know in an index or something and say this refers to that mm -hmm. um, is much cleaner well, and here's something else that can lower the barrier to entry for newcomers, um, and but also ties into what you're saying about supplements. And this is a little bit of a controversial topic, um, but giving away your basic rules for free. Now, some people hate me when I say that, mm -hmm. um, but there are some really successful places, you know, companies that have been very successful with putting a very stripped down version of their rules for free on their website. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're going to do that, the marketer in me says, make sure you capture those the people who download that, you know, email or something like that, so that you can engage them as a, you know, a future customer or anything else. And I'm not saying give away the whole, you know, store, um, but just you know, like the basic, like there's the D and D basic rules on Watsi's website. Privateer Press has their rules entirely online um, for War Machine and Hordes, um, and so technically you can try out the game with you know whatever you want at home of course they're also trying to entice you to buy the minis that's where they make the bulk of their money yeah um but several other companies have done that where there's a very stripped down basic version of the rules which can help with the situation of hey i'm browsing my game store um hey the supplement looks cool i don't know but they the core rule book isn't here i don't even know if i like this if there's a line in that supplement that refers you to that where they can kind of skim it, you can then maybe get a sale out of that, you know, yeah. because like, oh, this is kind of cool. And then they're, they're going to end up turning around and saying to the store owner, hey, by the way, can you order me a copy of the core rules? You know, uh, they, they haven't seen anything. It's much harder. So I'd like to, using this conversation, I'd like to go back to something you said earlier uh, in the in the panel about quick starts because that's exactly what quick starts are right is is a very stripped down version of your rules uh, presented in a way to say here is how you should play this game um, and usually like I think most quick starts that I see are between like ten and twenty pages um, quick starts especially PDF quick starts are this very magical uh, that is. Um, a taste of the book um, and so the idea is here are some very basic mechanics here's some very basic lore here are pre-generated characters and in some cases even here's an adventure so my favorite one that does this is swords fall i don't know if you've heard of swords fall i've heard um, of it but I haven't read it now so there's this really cool quick start for swords fall um which is um Fantasy, um, I th I'm pretty sure that the proper term that Swords Fall uses is um, African Futurism. Okay. Um, but it's uh, the, the quick start that you can get um, on their website um, or drive through maybe. Um, but it comes with pre-generated characters and it comes with an adventure. And the adventure is super short. Um, but it doesn't give like the traditional combat mechanics. And instead, it's a rap battle. Um, and it is the most engaging quick start I've ever seen. And that, that the design of that product is like mind blowingly fun. Um, and that, that quick start, uh, huh? Is that Jerry Grayson by any chance? I don't believe so. Okay. Um, uh, I don't remember his name. Brandon? I want to say. Anyway, um, one of the things uh, that that does is 
the communication this game is supposed to be in this quick start is like it's so fun and engaging uh game design is not just the math of you know how often are you going to succeed in your dice roll it is also the design of pre presentation of information and how you get people engaged with the with those math mechanics right and by being like uh everybody has uh you know these moves right and they're either openers or finishers and you use those moves to create your rap is just like it's so fun um uh, but that's kind of like, uh, you know, giving away your rules for free and engaging your customers uh, with, or engaging your players with easy ways to get a hold of a taste of your game. Right. And, and that's the trick. Like, the engagement is crucial, you know, because like I said, then that's why you don't want to plunk somebody down where you have to read a 200-page book, you know, mm -hmm. to figure things out and make a character and all that. You know, pre-gens, ways to chunk down the information into bullet points and bite-sized stuff. Yep. Once you have them engaged, they'll, they'll look at all kinds of other stuff later on. But you yeah. gotta get them in in the, in the first place. Right, and to circle back to how this uh, interacts with um, supplements are inaccessible. Um, yes, this is a long way of saying, yes, you're 100% correct. Um, but y there are ways to design your supplements or your supplemental material in ways that you're still going to engage with people. Um, and that's finding the correct section of your player base. Um, so the other part of this conversation is not every supplement is for every one of your players. And that is weird to say out loud as a business model, especially. Um, but we also know uh, we have market research that suggests that not every one of your players is going to buy every supplement and that needs to be okay. And what you should do is say, this particular supplement is for game masters or this particular supplement is for, you know, people who love playing wizards, um, you know, and that turns into things like this is a campaign book or, um, you know, uh, there's Book of Fiends, uh, which is a 5th edition supplement that has uh, a bunch of pre-statted out demons and devils and fiends and class options for, like, warlocks, right? That supplement is not for everyone, and that's okay. Um, and all you need to do is say, hey, this is the warlock I'm playing, uh, GM the relevant, you know, bits of text, and, and, and that's it. Um, yeah. And, and I think more, most importantly, and I know that I keep saying this, but that has to be okay, right? You cannot attempt to make a supplement for every single one of your fans. It just doesn't, just doesn't work. And you also may want to think about how you're packaging your game, because traditionally the model for the industry has been you release a core book, and then you release, you know, the campaign setting or several campaign settings if it's a universal system, um, various supplements and blah, 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 blah. And it can quickly become this, you know, huge shelf that even just to look at it in a game store can be daunting for a newcomer. Mm -hmm. um, one of the brilliant things that Pathfinder did was the beginner's box, which then WotC copied with the first the starter set and then the essential set. And WotC, by the way, was smart when they came out with the essentials kit because while it was completely separate and did slightly different things and introduced some new ideas like um, uh, how to have a companion so you could technically do a RPG between just a GM and one player, mm -hmm. um, uh, the story that was in it could be piggybacked with the story that was in the starter set to make something longer. Yep. So even if you already had the starter set, here's the enticement to possibly buy the essentials kit and vice versa. Um, but some kind of starter kit like that, separate from quick start, you know, definitely do like a quick start set of rules. <clears throat> but maybe your first product should not be a core rule book. Maybe your first product should be a starter set. And uh, Greater Than Games is doing the same thing, <clears throat> excuse me, that exact, <clears throat> excuse me, that exact same model with the Sentinels of the Multiverse RPG. Mm -hmm. um, they released the starter kit, 
they did the Kickstarter for the full thing, which is now shipped out to players. I'm waiting for it to end up on shelves for regular people. You know, because mm -hmm. all I have is the story kit. I want the regular book. Right. Um, but that's, you know, just because the business has always done it like this doesn't necessarily mean you should do it that way if you're trying to lower that barrier to entry. Yeah. And, and if you are designing a story kit, you know, think about it from you're teaching the rules, you're teaching the GM and everything else and how to make all of that accessible. Right. And I think an important thing to talk about in that is... um your customers, your players aren't engaging with your game the first time that they read the the rules. Uh, they might be engaging with your product for the first time when they open the box or when they look at the box on the shelf at a store. You know, depending on, you know, if you go to the Kickstarter model or, you know, you go straight to distribution or what have you. Um, or, you know, you are just doing dry RPG, um, there's an engagement level that you're, you have with these people the first time that they even see the name of your, your product or the, they see the, the cover, uh, the cover art, right? Um, I was talking with Daniel Fox with Zweihander. Uh, recently about the Freedom in Flames Kickstarter campaign um, and how the cover art for that campaign took months to put together because he knew that the cover art was what people were going to engage with the first time, right? Because he did a Kickstarter model. So whenever they see his the image, that's the first impression that they're going to have. And so, so much care and time went into that cover art just because he knew it was the first time that, that they were engaging. That's design. That's that's design in its kind of cover design or graphic design, but it's still design work. Um, and so if you're making one of these boxes and people pull the lid off or something and they see this mess of you know books and papers and stuff, um, that might be daunting too. So having a little uh, you know hello greeting paper uh, inside here. your uh, for your box that says, "Hey, uh, this is these are what all of these things are." You know, mm -hmm. you're holding this booklet in your hand, and it it contains an adventure. And you're holding this booklet in your hand, and it contains the rules. And then there are these loose sheets and dice, um, and having a little page right when they open the box that says, "These are what all these things are," is kind of comforting. Yeah, yeah, a little a little start here. You know, mm -hmm. instructions. Um, Sarah, just wanted to touch base with you. Are we having any questions or comments or anything like that? Because we're coming up on, uh, you know, 20 minutes left. Uh, not a lot. One, the person who had talked about supplements potentially being inaccessible clarified that they were specifically responding to talking about websites. Um, so it's not just printing costs. And then someone mm -hmm. shared uh, the link for Swords Fall. Oh, gotcha. nice. Yeah. Thank you very much for sharing that link. Um, so having supplements on your website, yeah, it's a little weird. I, I tell people kind of that if you're putting information on your website, even putting it, distilling that into a PDF and putting it up on drive through for free or whatever, um, it is not only good accessibility, but it's kind of good common sense, um, because people... People go to drive through RPG because they have other RPGs in drive through RPG. They want to keep the library consolidated. Putting, it in, putting stuff into channels where people already are is super smart. It's kind of why uh, Kickstarter works better than things like you know, Indiegogo um, because already on Kickstarter. Um, so it's not a not a bad thing to do to just put it in m multiple places. Mm -hmm. the, the supplement thing is a tricky issue, and that can actually go into an entirely different panel topic on the business model for the RPG industry, which mm -hmm. I think is long overdue to be reevaluated and tried to come up with something different. I have not figured that out yet. You know, I'm, I'm not that smart. Mm -hmm. um, but it is a tricky business model of that, you know, you keep selling supplements, 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 
and then eventually that can break your rules or make your rules so bogged down and you know and then sometimes it's too daunting as you said for newcomers to come in like i said i used to hang out at this one local game store a lot and uh you would see all the time the new people come in and they would sometimes sometimes not always but navigate to the the games that had the least books because it was less daunting to them yeah you know? um so it is it a tricky proposition yeah we had another question just come in an actual play video isn't the same as a tutorial video are both necessary and you prioritize one over the other Ooh, i would do both if you can yeah so i have a lot of thoughts here okay, um, <laughs> um a how-to video is marketing um and there is a design element to a how to play you know tutorial video um i have attempted to put a number of tutorial videos together for some green ronin products um some of them turned out fine and some of them didn't um in the age of actual play um I don't know that tutorial videos are as necessary as they used to be, but it is still uh, super easy to put together and do uh, in a way that a lot of people won't even buy your book unless they can see, it. they don't want to read, you know, 60 pages of rules. Um, they just want to see somebody do it so that it clicks for them. Um, I think that actual plays have stepped on the toes of how to play videos. However, um, or actual plays have stepped on the toes of how to play videos. However, um, most actual plays are done by third parties um, or in partnership with other people, which means that you are not 100% in control with where those videos go or where those videos live. Um, or what content is always in those videos. Um, and so that is a good enough argument for me that having a tutorial video that you can host on your website or that you can host um, in the little description part of your drive through RPG uh, uh, product page uh, are all really good ideas. Um, and all, if for no other reason, then you're in control of that. And I'm going to add on to that, which is uh, a reason why to have a tutorial. Which you prioritize is, is, is tricky. It's a little chicken and egg. Um, but why to have a tutorial video or videos? Because I would actually suggest maybe you do them as short segments. I mean, it's going to depend upon your game and how your game works and everything else. Um, but maybe it, for as much as you can, make them you know quick, short shots. So people who are a little confused by something can go straight to that actual plays are almost always several hours so mm -hmm. that that's going to be a little again useful but also can be a little daunting for people uh, if they just want to get a sense of something yeah. um but the other reason why uh, it's good to have a video is people learn in different ways mm -hmm. uh not everybody learns well from reading um and particularly if a person ha is dyslexic or something like that whereas if there is seen a video you know, for a certain chunk of your audience, that's going to be much more appealing. And that's going to be much more accessible to them. So, again, lowering barriers to entry. And also, too, you know, um, it's not just as far as, like, dyslexia, um, you know, visual issues. You know, we're getting older as a, as a group. Um, you know, a video that somebody can listen to or a podcast version of it or something like that is much more accessible to someone who has low vision or is blind. Mm -hmm. Because that's another aspect of lowering the barrier to entry. Because there are a lot of people who would love to play RPGs, but due to disabilities, it's not always easy for them. Yep. Yeah, and yep. that's a missing piece of the marketplace. Yeah, I've been sitting on another question in the chat about audiobooks. Do you think there's a, a good way to implement audiobooks in RPGs? God, I wish. Because um, I have had many eye surgeries, so audiobooks are now a big part of my life they never used to be. I would love to see more audiobooks in the game industry. That said, rule books as audiobooks Ugh. are a little tricky because that reference factor is difficult. 
Yeah, there's also a lot of like tables and charts and stuff like that that don't translate well into audiobooks. Um, so Green Ronin, we do audiobooks for our fiction line, um, and so we have that kind of, uh, you know, experience. Uh, but even even with that, like, uh, it's it's so hard to consider because. Um, Layout, you know, is an important factor, and and sometimes hearing somebody uh, emotionlessly read uh, again to go back to the textbook reference, just you know, uh, m m some like reference material or math or something like that is just n not super translatable into an audiobook. Oh, even worse than that is using a PDF reader. Mm -hmm. which when I was running certain campaigns at the store, like I said, for organized play, but while still recovering from eye surgeries, that was the easiest way for me to learn what I needed to do. But man, was that torture. Because <laughs> you're talking literally mechanical voice with no inflection and putting it all in the wrong place. I would love to see more audiobooks in the industry, but again, we got to figure out a way to make it work better. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just don't know that the technology is up where we want it to be yet. Um, so, but uh, the other thing uh, that I guess I, uh, the other accessibility thing, new, or lowering the barrier to entry thing to think about is lots of people are playing on Roll20 now. Uh, and getting your product up on Roll20 and getting together with that team to learn how to, you know, program what weird dice needs you need uh, or you have or or putting your character sheet up there um, to automate uh, character creation um, or like thinking about things like that um, are going to help uh, your design structures um, because that is another way that people are learning right now uh, there's a, a, a a friend of mine who's running a group for the Alien RPG didn't read the book, uh, bought the thing on Roll20, fired it up, and, you know, f kind of just figured it out from the Roll20 and the Quick Start, and that was it. That was all that they needed um, because it does a lot of the automation for you. Mm -hmm. And that's where I'm going to say something nobody's going to want to hear, which is... <clears throat> with COVID, we're going to be dealing with life like this for at least eight more months, maybe mm -hmm. a year. Because even if they have a completely safe vaccine tomorrow, it's going to take time to distribute and everything else. Yep. Um, but the thing is, though, even after all of this goes away, people have now gotten used to this. Mm -hmm. um, and it now it's much easier for you know my weekly gaming group it's easier for people who moved away to play in the group again. Yeah. You know, because uh, before we did everything face to face. Um, so again, think about, do you even, yes, design, think about Roll20 if that works for you, but also think about, you know, if you're doing a game that doesn't involve a battle mat, um, do you need a Roll20? Can you play the game over Zoom? Mm -hmm. I mean, think about these things or Discord, you right. know. Um, it's all going to depend upon your game, but start thinking about these questions. Yeah, there's a there's a more accessibility. There's a lot of weird design space in like uh, board games and war games that have adapted to technology way faster than role playing games, um, and so looking at stuff like um, uh, uh, Fantasy Flight's Descent uh, or Journeys in Middle Earth um, or the old. Um, Hairbrain schemes, Golem Arcana, mm -hmm. um, all have like these app uh, that do like all the tracking for you. It, you, your your input, your thought, your the math that the players have to do in those games is so small because it's all automated. Um, and thinking about things like that, like as a designer it's how do i communicate the information of my game as as easily as possible but also how do i make the thought process easy um there's lots of crunchy games out there who compile their information in really easy and pleasing ways so that it is crunchy but you don't have to think about it yeah. um and and so 
adapting to technology and, uh, you know, partnering with a, a web developer to make a website or um, an app that might, you know, make, make your structures easier or your math easier um, are super, super easy ways to lower your barrier of entry. Which actually reminds me of one weird little thing that it, it's weird because I'm always surprised how many people don't know this. Um, but when you're talking about somebody who's never played a game before, um, if you're sitting at a physical table, the easy thing to do is if you need dice, you can loan them dice. Um, now that people are playing remotely, there is a little bit, and particularly depending upon, you know, depending on where you're playing, you may not necessarily have a, a dice bot or something like that. Pretty much any smartphone, you don't even necessarily need a dice app. You can literally just say to the phone or put in the thing, roll me a D100 or roll me a D20, and it'll do it. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a weird little trick that surprisingly a lot, a lot of people realize. And again, that if you've got a phone, you have dice. Mm -hmm. it's that's, I mean, unless you're doing like a weird, complicated dice you know, mechanism. Sure. Um, but it's that simple, even without an app. And then, of course, there's all kinds of free apps for that. But that's been a stumbling block that I've come across with people, and I'm like, no, just take out your smartphone. You know, just, you know, hey Siri, roll up whatever, and yeah. it'll do it for you um, to, to make things a little bit easier. Well, I know we're getting close on time. Sarah, is there anything else, that, uh, you know, before we wrap that uh, people have questions or comments on? I don't see anything else in the chat right now. Uh, Does anybody have any last minute questions to get in before we go? Mm-hmm. One thing I'll ask, so I have dice and have never played an RPG. True story. Where do new pe where do newbies go to find game groups? Where what are places that you can oh. direct people? Your game groups? Oh, this one's fun. Um uh Facebook. Um look for uh local Facebook groups um that are RPG uh, groups, um, particularly Dungeons and Dragons has groups that are like divided by region uh, all across the world. Um, you can go to there are a couple of subreddits that are like looking for group. Um, if you're looking to play online, um, go to Roll Twenty and uh, there's a like you can sort uh, by what game you're looking for, and it'll tell you like. Uh, you know, we play alien RPG Thursday nights or whatever, and whether or not they're looking for people. Um, what my, I go ahead. I was going to say my prior go-to suggestion used to be meup.com, which was uh, uh, what is a website where you can find physical places over around different topics. Um, now with COVID, a lot of those places, because like you know, game stores would list their events there and things like that. A lot of that stuff has moved online. Mm -hmm. You know, so you can still, you know, it's still a decent resource, though you may have to uh, play with it a little bit. Yeah. So what I used to do 20, you know, 15, 20 years ago is I would go to my local game store and they had like a cork board of like, we're looking to play, you know, fourth edition every Wednesday night. And it would have one of those tags with the phone number on it. You rip it off. Um, now what I would suggest is if you know what game you're looking to play, go to that publisher's website and they will have like a discord or a message board or something like that. And you can engage with other fans. Um, it is the best way to learn a game in my opinion, because you're engaging with the people who already are super familiar with it or people who are like you who want to learn this specific game. Also, um, that, that publisher or, ga or game may have a Facebook group. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, look for that, separate from, like, the generic, um, you know, role-playing uh, groups on Facebook. Yeah. They, those people, those publishers may also have, like, a demo team. Um, so, like, at conventions like this one, um, like PAX a couple of weeks ago uh, and Roll20Con a couple of weeks ago, we had our uh, demo team out at those places in force uh, running all of our RPGs. Uh, so, uh, 30 seconds. Okay, so thank you very much for attending. Um, if you... Uh, not sure how to wrap up anymore. <laughs>
<laughs> Sorry, the COVID rainfall got me. Thanks for attending, folks. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and uh, we will see you around. Good luck on all of your design, and see you around.